words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. The 23rd verse in the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, this verse, as most of you will probably recall, comes as a kind of connecting link between the two exhortations uh, which the uh, Apostle makes here. Uh, The first is that he calls upon uh, these Ephesians to put off the old men, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And the second is that they put on the new men, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. But in between these two exhortations comes this 23rd verse, which we are going to look at together this morning. Now, this uh, I want to try to show you is a most important verse. Most important from every standpoint. For one thing, it marks the transition in the Apostle's exhortation here from the negative to the positive. We've been considering his exhortation that they should negatively put off the old men and all that belongs to him. There it was, it was negative. But now he's going to turn to the positive. But before he actually comes to the positive and tells us to put on the new men, he insinuates, he inserts this particular statement. So the statement is, as I say, the beginning of the positive. But it is something much more than that. Because it would be very wrong to regard this phrase, this statement, as merely an introduction to what is coming. It is that, but it's more than that. Indeed, I make bold to suggest that this uh, phrase, which is here between the two exhortations, and which in a sense is just a connecting link, is in reality the key to the understanding and the secret of being able to put off the old and to put on the new. He chooses to put it in this particular way. A man, I say, will never really put off the old, and he will never put on the new, until he has been renewed in the spirit of his mind. Here he tells us how it is exactly that we can do that, and why we should ever do so. So it is one of these profound statements of doctrine which abound so much, we have noticed not only in the earlier part of this epistle, but even here in this very practical section, where the apostle is in a sense simply applying his great doctrine and exhorting these Ephesians now uh, that they henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, but that if they have truly learned Christ, they will put off forever everything that savored of or indicated that old men, and put on the new. Very well then, obviously face to face with such an important statement, the first thing we must do is to define our terms and to understand exactly uh, what the apostle is saying. The first thing he tells us is, and be renewed. Now here's an interesting expression. What does it mean? Well, The answer is that it really does literally mean precisely what it says. It means renewed. Or if you like, it means being made new again. It suggests a restoration to a previous condition that once obtained. It suggests that there has been a departure from that and that what we need is to be brought back to that, a renew, a renewing again, or a making new again, once more. 
a bringing back. Now, I hope to show you the significance of that statement, but that is exactly what the word means. Then you notice, at least uh, it is important that we should notice, that the authorized version doesn't quite give us the tense of this uh, verb here. It is really the continuous present. He says that they must go on being renewed in this way. It isn't something that happens once and for all, this. We saw that putting off is something that is once and for all. Putting on is the same, but this being renewed is something that goes on. It is being renewed. It's continuous, it's present, it must go on and on and on. That, again, clearly, is a very important point. And the third point about this word is that it's in the passive. It is not something that you and I do. Now, the putting off, as I've been emphasizing, is our action. The putting on is our action. But this is not ours. This is something that happens to us. We are to go on being renewed. This is indeed the work of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And yet it's obvious, I think, that though we've got to emphasize and to stress that, the very way in which the Apostle puts it clearly indicates that we can hinder this work. And there is no question about that at all. Now, I'm not talking about conversion. I am talking about something that is happening to the men who is already born again. They're the people to whom the Apostle is writing. It is because they have been born again, he tells them, that he exhorts them in this way. So we do say about the Christian that he can hinder this work. He can quench the spirit. He can grieve the spirit. So while the main emphasis is upon the fact that this is something that is done to us, our mind is being renewed by the Holy Spirit, yes, but we must be careful that we do not hinder it or in any way frustrate it, but that we do all we can in order to promote it and to encourage it. So we may translate the statement like this, that you go on being constantly renewed. That is what the Apostle actually said. Very well. Then we come to this next expression. That you go on constantly being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now here is a most profound statement and a most important one for our clear understanding of Christian doctrine. You notice that he doesn't say that we are to be renewed only in our mind. We are to be renewed in our minds, yes, but he doesn't just say the mind only. He says the spirit of the mind. Well, now, what does the word spirit mean? Well, there's been a good deal of discussion about this. Some would say that it means the Holy Spirit in the mind, but it obviously cannot mean that for this good reason, that the Holy Spirit is never referred to anywhere in Scripture as the spirit of our mind. We are told the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Yes, but he's not our Holy Spirit. So the spirit of the mind cannot mean the Holy Spirit influencing the mind. The Holy Spirit does influence the mind, but the, what the Apostle is talking about here is the spirit of the mind. In the same way, we must indicate that he doesn't mean our spirits. Now, this means that we've got to remind ourselves again of the way in which the Bible uh, dissects and analyzes the human personality. If you like the term, we must uh, for a moment glance at biblical psychology. And what it tells us about uh, ourselves is this, that in men there is mind, the uh, seat of understanding, the mind. There is also the heart, the seat of the emotions and feelings. There is also the soul, which is the seat of the sensations. And then there is the spirit in men. Now, 
I know that there's a great argument as to whether men is two parts or three. Some say you must only talk about body and soul. And you mustn't say body, soul, and spirit, that tripartite view. Well, this is a subject that can never be decided by anybody because we notice that the scripture itself, this apostle himself, does. Uh, you remember in the last chapter of the first epistle to the Thessalonians, uh, talk about our whole body, soul, and spirit. And we read in the fourth chapter of Hebrews about dividing asunder even the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Now, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter which of the views you take, as long as you recognize this. That if you say that there is only one thing, in a, one organ, as it were, in addition to the body, it's all right if you say that on condition that you recognize that there are two parts to that, or two aspects to it. So it comes to the same thing in the end. There is the soul in men, the seat of the sensations, that by which... Man has communion with his fellows and so on. Yes, but there's something higher. There is this spirit that is in men. And this is undoubtedly the highest thing that is in us and in our constitutions. Well now, reading your Bibles, you must have noticed that oftentimes these terms are used interchangeably. Sometimes the word mind is used for the whole person. Sometimes the heart is used not only for the seat of the affections and the emotions, but for the whole personality again, including the mind. The soul is used in the same way, and the spirit is used in the same way. Well, very well, says someone. Can we ever know which meaning is to be attached? To which the answer is that if you pay careful attention to the context, you will generally find that you're able to do so. And here is an instance of that. Here he talks, you see, about the spirit of the mind. So spirit and mind obviously do not mean the same thing. And indeed he is not even speaking of our spirits, as I say. He is speaking in particular of what he calls the spirit of the mind. Now what does this mean? Well, I want to suggest it means this. It means the interior principle that really governs and controls and operates the mind itself. I mean by that that in addition to our faculties and our powers and our intellectual abilities, there is a sort of spirit of the mind that controls the whole operation. That's the thing to which he is referring here. The spirit, spirit the word spirit means breath, it means power, it's wind. So he's talking here about the power of the mind. Not simply the abilities of the mind, but the power that controls and directs the abilities. Now, we are obviously dealing with something very profound here, and I do hope that you all are enjoying it and that you revel in it. What a book this Bible is. People say that to be a Christian means you suddenly become soft and throw your intellect overboard and... Just spend your time singing choruses and being emotional. Well, if there are such Christians, they're very poor Christians. This was written to Christians 2,000 years ago when they hadn't got uh, all our educational facilities. Here it was written to people, most of whom had been slaves. And here he is, you see, analyzing the mind into these uh, various categories. The abilities and the spirit at the back, the spirit of your mind. Here is profound thought profound philosophy, profound psychology. And you and I are supposed to understand this and to grapple with it and to understand it because, as I'm going to show you, this, says the apostle, is the thing that really governs and controls everything else. Now then, he says, what you need above everything else is to go on being renewed in the spirit of your mind. That part of yourself which really governs and controls your mind. Very well, there are our terms defined. And having defined our terms, we can come to the doctrine. What is the teaching here? What is the doctrine? Well, in a sense, we can put it like this. The apostle here is giving one of his own profoundest definitions of the Christian. Let's watch him as he does it. 
here, it seems to me, are the component parts. First of all, he is indicating to us what sin and the fall of men has really done to us. Now, I get that, you see, by this word, renewed. What you need, he says, is that you be brought back to where you were with respect to your mind. Your mind needs to be renovated, renewed. It needs to be made new again to, as it once was. It must be brought back to that. Very well, at once, you see, he is suggesting that it's departed from that. And that is exactly, of course, what happened when man fell. Oh, there is nothing that is so important for us as to understand the doctrine of the fall. Man in sin. It's the key to the whole Bible. I don't see how a man can really understand the doctrine of salvation unless he understands something at any rate about the doctrine of the fall. And that is why, you see, the Old Testament is as essential to a Christian as is the New. He can't understand his New Testament without the Old Testament. Because the fact is that God made man perfect, but man fell. And what happened when he fell? Well, says the Apostle, this is the serious thing. When men fell, it was not merely and not only that he disobeyed God in that one particular respect and thereby became a transgressor and thereby committed a particular act of sin and thereby began to feel miserable and unhappy and lost a number of the benefits and the joys that he'd had previously. All that is true and many other things. But you know, says the Apostle, the most devastating thing that happened was that the spirit of man's mind went wrong. That's the essence of the fall. As the result of men listening to the devil, he put himself under the power of the devil, under the dominion of Satan, as Paul puts it in writing to the Romans. And the result of that has been that man's mind, the spirit of his mind, has been under an alien domination, uh, putting it in another way, I can put it like this, that the trouble with men in sin, the trouble with all of us as the result of the sin of Adam, we are born like this into the world. Our essential trouble is not so much that we do things that are wrong, of course, that's bad enough, but the real trouble and the horrible thing about us all is this, that as we are by nature, our whole outlook is wrong. It's the spirit of our mind that's wrong. Our fundamental way of thinking and of reasoning has become twisted and perverted and vitiated. That is exactly what the Bible says about the whole world in its present position of chaos and of trouble. The world is as it is because it doesn't know how to think straightly. And the first call of this gospel is for men to think straightly. Be renewed. In the spirit of your mind. They can't do that. They need the operation of the Holy Spirit. But once regeneration has taken place, well then, they're exhorted to this. Now let me prove to you what I'm saying. Listen to the way in which it's put in the book of Genesis, in chapter 6, at the time just before the flood. This is what God says about mankind, about the world that he was going to judge and to destroy in the flood. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What a diagnosis again. What a psychological analysis. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. It's still the same place. That's the spirit of the mind. Analyze still further. The imagination comes in. The feelings come in. This principle at the back of the mind, that's the thing that's gone wrong. Now, look at it in this way. It isn't the mind as an instrument that's gone wrong. We must be perfectly clear about that. Because somebody might want to interrupt me at this point and say, but wait a minute, are you standing in that pulpit therefore and saying that every man who is not a Christian can't think at all and has no ability? 
because if you are, you're obviously wrong. Look at these great scientists, not Christian. Look at these great philosophers, not Christian. Poets and so on. Are you saying that they have no ability? Of course I'm not. That is where it is important to differentiate between the mind and the spirit of the mind. The trouble with man is not in his mind, but in the spirit of his mind. They've got the faculties, they've got the abilities. They can be geniuses at mathematics, physics, chemistry, philosophy, any one of these things. The mind, as it were, as an organ, just as a machine that works and reasons and calculates and thinks and so on, that's all right. But what's gone wrong is the governing power at the back of it all. Now, let me use what seems to me to be one of the best commentaries on all this. It isn't exactly right, but it can be used as an illustration. The apostle in writing to the Romans in chapter 6, in verse 19, puts it like this. He recognizes it's rather a difficult matter. So he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, he says, I'm going to use an illustration because you find it difficult to understand what I'm saying. Well, now I'm trying to do the same thing. For, he says, as you have yielded your members, that's to say your faculties, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. The same members, you see. He says, as you have been using your faculties and powers in that direction, now use them in this direction. It's the same faculties exactly, but what is changed is the direction, the spirit that controls them. Now then, there, I say, is the devastating thing that the fall and sin have done to the human race. The mind of men, which was at the beginning governed by the spirit, is now governed by the flesh. All men's thinking is vitiated to that extent. But of course, it only becomes terribly important when you begin to think about the things of the spirit. He's all right still as a physicist, a chemist, a doctor, a philosopher, or what, or what not. But even there, at a given point, he goes wrong. But within the limits, he can be excellent. But the moment you come to the things that really matter, man's whole being and his relationship to God and time and eternity, there, man's thinking fails completely because the spirit of his mind has gone astray. Now then, if you want to read all this at leisure in the scripture, you read the second chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. Here it is, you see, in its essence. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he. Why? Because they are spiritually deserved. Is he saying that the natural man is not a Christian because he hasn't a brain? He's not. He's saying that his brain is no use to him because the spirit that controls it prevents his grasping this. It's the spirit of the mind that's wrong, not the mind as an instrument. I do trust that this is being plain and clear because if we grasp this, we will never be surprised again that certain great people are not Christians. You know, these people they put on, on the third program and so on and who write and who talk to us, they're not Christians and some Christians tremble in their shoes, they say. Well, after all, may I be wrong, these great men, they don't believe it. Well, you shouldn't be surprised. They are great men. Let's grant that they've got greater brains than we have, greater instruments as such. But you see, it isn't the instrument that matters. It's the spirit of the mind that matters. There it is, says Paul. Well, you'll find he says the same thing in the second chapter of this epistle to the Ephesians, the first three verses. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's virtually the same thing. And then again in the epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, he puts it like this, to be carnally minded is death. You see, carnally minded, there, there again is the distinction, the spirit is carnal, the mind's all right, but it's to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
It's the spirit of the mind, he says, that is wrong. Very well then, here is the real trouble with men. It isn't merely that he does things that he shouldn't do and that he doesn't do what he should do. The real tragedy of every man who is not a Christian this morning is this, that in the very citadel, the highest point of his being, in the spirit of his mind, he has gone astray. What can be a greater tragedy than this? You know, some of the people who live for evil in this world and who make money out of it and who organize it have got wonderful brains. They're geniuses at it. They've got the ability, but there's the tragedy, that all this ability is being prostituted. It's being turned and used in an utterly wrong direction. It's the spirit of the mind that has gone astray and therefore needs to be renewed. Very well then. What does regeneration do? That's the second point. Now here, of course, the apostle doesn't give us an elaborate account of regeneration, but he does put his finger on the essential principle. This is the thing of all things that happens in regeneration. What is it? What do we need? What does man in sin need? Well, obviously, in the light of all I've been saying, he doesn't need new faculties. Because the faculties are all right. A man doesn't need to have a new brain in order to become a Christian. The same brain will do all right as long as its spirit is changed. How important all this is. You see, when a man becomes a Christian, he doesn't become one iota, an abler man than he was before. Not at all. He's still got the same brain. Same faculties. Whatever they were, they still are. If he was a genius in sin, he'll be a genius as a preacher. The Apostle Paul was like that. He was a persecutor beyond everybody. He beat them all, and then he became a Christian and became the greatest preacher of them all. The same intensity, the same zeal. You see, this is often forgotten, isn't it? And I've seen people crucifying their faculties. That's a terrible thing to do. You're never meant to do it. What you were, you are. The same faculties, the same powers, yes, but the spirit which controls them is the thing that, are cha- is the thing that is changed. So the same natural differences between person and person will still be there. All Christians are not equally able. Does that need to be said? I sometimes think it does. All are not called to teach and to preach. Some people seem to think they are, that any man who's a Christian automatically does what everybody else. No, no. The, the abilities are still there, and they have to be considered and taken into consideration. So I say that what we receive in regeneration is not new faculties. What we receive is this new spirit that controls. A new disposition is put into us. A new principle of life is put in. A new spirit enters into the mind and controls it and directs it so that whereas formerly it went in that direction, it's now going in this direction. It was all out there, it's all out here. Yes, it's the control that matters. It's this life-giving principle. That's what he means by the renewing. The mind is enlightened. Purely as a brain qua brain, It is precisely what it was before. Yes, but now, you see, the natural men who couldn't receive the things of the Spirit of God can receive them. And the brain that was useless to him before in these matters now becomes invaluable to him. But it is because this Spirit has entered in and taken control of him, the Spirit of his mind has been put back in control Whereas, as the result of the fall, it had gone out of control. Well, now, what does this lead to? Well, this, you see, just means that a man who is a Christian not only thinks different things, but still more important, he thinks in a new way. That's what it is, what happens to the Christian. He's a man who's enabled to think in a new way. He thought before as a non-Christian. He still thinks, ah, but he's thinking in a new way. Let me help you. Listen to the poet putting it. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. 
Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. But the Christless eyes can see, of course they can. The Christless eyes can see the flowers. And so can the Christian eyes see the flowers, and they're looking at the same flowers. And the non-Christian can tell you the name of the flower as well as the other, perhaps better. He can dissect it, analyze it, he knows all about it. He sees and he can write his report. So can the Christian. They're both looking at the same thing. And up to a point, the reports are identical. And yet you know the Christian sees something the other man doesn't see. Heaven above is softer blue. The non-Christian gives his report. He says the heavens are blue. He's perfectly right. But he hasn't seen the softness. Oh, the Christian looks up and he looks at the heavens and he sees not only that physical thing, that something, that material something, there's a radiance there the other man can't see. It's the glory of God. It's the God behind it. It's all in the eighth psalm for you. When I behold the heavens, the work of thy fingers. Ah, he's seen something extra. He not only sees what's there, he sees the fingers of God that have made it. The sun and the moon and the stars which thou hast made. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around, what about it? Well, it's green, says the non-Christian. Of course, he's perfectly right. Ah, but says the Christian, earth around is sweeter green. What's happening? Well, what's happening is, you see, that the two men, their brain power is identical, but there's something extra. The spirit of the mind is changed in this Christian. Something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs or slow flowers with deeper beauties shine. Since I know, as now I know, I am his, and he is mine. What's happened to this man? Oh, the spirit of his mind has been renewed. He's not a greater intellect than he was before. No, no, but this intellect of his, which couldn't do certain things, can now do them. And it's being able to, and able to function in this new way. He is thinking in a new manner. He not only talks about different things, but he does everything in a different way. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what happens to the Christian. You see, that man, he was a slave to drink. And he couldn't pass a public house without being tempted and falling, and in he went. But now he's become a Christian. He's born again. He's been regenerated And what you say about him, you say, old things are passed away. He passes the same public house, but he doesn't see what he saw before. Of course, physically, he sees exactly the same thing, same building, same paint, same color, same name over it, everything. There's no change, and yet everything's different. It isn't the same place. What's happened? There's no change in the public house. There's no change in his brain, quay brain. What's changed? The spirit of his mind. You see, he's thinking in a different way. Though he looks at and meditates about and cogitates concerning precisely the same data, he doesn't see the same thing. The spirit of his mind is changed. Now, there's your doctrine. What does all this mean in practice, says someone? Well, here are the practical deductions. When the apostle tells us to put off the old men and to put on the new men, He is not, therefore, you see, calling us to a mechanical conformity. He is asking us to put into practice an intelligent change. Need I emphasize that? Doesn't it follow logically from all that I've been saying? That's why he puts this, you see, in between the two things. Now, let me put it like this quite plainly and bluntly. The apostle gives these instructions not as a drill sergeant does. The drill sergeant doesn't appeal to intelligence. He bawls out instructions. Put off, put on. That's not what we have here at all. The Christian life is not a mechanical life. 
Does this need to be emphasized? You know I have a fear it does. I see too many Christians doing things by numbers these days. Put off, put on. They attend little classes, given instructions, trained how to do this. If he says this, you say that. Trained to be evangelists and to give their personal witness and testimony. There's nothing about that in the New Testament. What the New Testament is to train the man, put him right. And then he goes on and does the work. It's the spirit of the mind that needs to be changed. The Christian doesn't do things without knowing why he's doing them. He doesn't do them just because he's been told to do them. Command, one, two, three, not at all. Intelligence. The spirit of the mind. If you don't know why you're living as you're living, my friend, you're, you're being a very poor Christian. The Christian can give a reason for the hope that is in him always with meekness and fear. It's not a mechanical thing. It's highly intelligent. The spirit of your mind. Or let me put it like this. The apostle is not calling only for an outward change of actions and of habits. What he is really calling for is this inward change in the mind. Because he knows that if a man's inward mind is changed, he'll soon deal with the outward actions. In other words, let's put it like this. The Apostle Paul is not asking you to take off one uniform and put on another. It includes that, but it isn't only that. You see, you can do that and not be a Christian. That's the terrible part of it, isn't it? Christianity is always something that works from within outwards, never from without inwards. That's the whole principle. So you don't just take off one uniform, put on the other. Anybody can do that. A man who is not regenerate can do that. You see, that's the difference between morality and Christianity. The merely moral man is a man who takes off the bad suit and puts on the good suit. But he is still unchanged, and therefore he's not a Christian, though to outward appearance he looks all right. He's put off the old man, he's put on the new man, but still he's not a Christian. The spirit of his mind isn't changed. That's not only the difference between the moral men and the Christian men, it is the difference between the hypocrite and the true Christian. It is the difference between what the Puritans called the temporary believer, the temporary professor, the, the gospel hypocrite, and the true Christian. It's a most important thing, this. I believe, you know, this was the curse, in a sense, of the end of the Victorian period and the early years of this present century. I'm afraid that our Christian churches were filled with people who had just taken off the old and put on the new, but the spirits of their mind had never been changed. And they didn't know why they were doing it. It was the tradition. They'd been brought up to go to places of worship, not to do this and to do that. That was the curse of Victorianism. Thank God we've come to the end of that. I'd sooner have the present position than that, because those people thought they were Christians, and so many of them had never been Christians and knew nothing about it. If this putting off and putting on is not the result of the renewing of the mind, it has no value. We must not only live the new life, but we must want to do so. We must desire to do so. We must feel that it's inevitable. We must feel that we have no choice. We must understand the logic. It isn't our actions only that Christianity is concerned about. It's much more concerned about us. That's why the Bible tells you, you know, that in the end Jacob was the man and not Esau. Esau was much more of a gentleman and a much nicer man, but he was no good, he was profane. Jacob, with all his rottenness, was God's man. It isn't our actions alone that matter, that's morality, I say. It's us, ourselves, the spirit of the mind. So we don't just do this thing in an outward way. It's not a mere outward change of apparel and of clothing. And that brings me to my third and my last principle in the practical sense, which is this. Becoming Christian then not only does not mean that you simply change your suit or change your actions and outward behavior, do you know it doesn't even mean this? It doesn't just mean that you change your opinions. It doesn't just mean, you see, changing your mind. It means changing the spirit of your mind. Oh, what a distinction. 
Obviously, a man who becomes a Christian changes his opinions. Yes, but that doesn't make him a Christian, you know, in and of itself. Because what makes a man a Christian is not that he's got different opinions from what he had, but that the spirit of his mind is different. The spirit of his mind, that he's thinking in a different way. In other words, Christianity is not something that you and I take up intellectually. It is something that takes us up and captivates us and governs us and controls us. This to me is one of the most alarming things of all. I have known people, and God forbid that I should be guilty of judging, but I have known people who, having come to live in evangelical circles, begin to use evangelical phrases. They hear them so frequently, and they adopt them. And they begin to use them. And if you're a superficial observer, you might say, Ah, these people are now truly Christian. Can't you hear them? They're talking now as evangelical believers. I don't mean this to be funny. But you know, a parrot can do that. A parrot can repeat evangelical phrases and cliches. If he only hears them often enough, he'll repeat them. And it is possible for us to do something like that. How do I know this about such people? Well, I know it like this. If you suddenly confront them with a question or a problem where they haven't got a pat answer, you'll find that they don't know how to think spiritually. The spirit of their minds is not changed at all. It's the old mind which is repeating phrases, using the language, but they betray, oh, how tragically, that really they've never started thinking in a Christian way at all. They say things now and again, and you're just shocked and amazed. You say, I thought this person had really seen it, and they betray at once they've never really seen it. They've just been repeating phrases. They know the right thing to say. Anybody with intelligence hearing it frequently ought to be able to do so. Ah, but the test of the Christian is not simply in what he says, not simply in the opinions that he puts forward. It's the spirit of his mind. Look here, says Paul, if the spirit of your mind is changed and is renewed, well, then you'll be thinking in such a way that you'll put off the old man, you'll put on the new man. And then you'll do it properly. And you'll do it in the right way. The terrible thing is that it's possible for us to appear to be right almost in every respect and yet to be wrong ourselves the whole time. We can put it on as clothing, as a mask, as it were. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't you know people like this? You feel that everything's right about them except them themselves. In other words, everything seems to have changed except the vital thing, the spirit of the mind. And here, says the apostle, is something that must go on and on and on. Obviously, just when we are converted, we see the one great truth. But we need to be taught a lot, don't we? Why, we need to be taught how to think. You'll hear young Christians saying things that are quite appalling from the standpoint of a mature Christian. In a sense, they can't help it. They're babes. The spirit of their mind has got to be renewed. They've now got to start learning to think in this new way. The whole outlook, the whole attitude, the very spirit of their thinking has got to be something entirely renovated. And then you'll begin to see them working it out and applying it. And it's one of the most glorious and fascinating things that happens in life. I'm speaking as a pastor. I know of nothing more thrilling, more entrancing than just to watch some of you, my friends, undergoing this very process of having the spirit of your minds renewed. It's wonderful. It isn't simply that you stop doing what you used to do and that you've taken up doing things that you didn't do and that you're speaking in a way in which you didn't speak. Oh, much more fascinating and charming is to see that the very spirit of the mind is different. The whole outlook, the very method of thinking, 
has now become Christian. We need to be Christianized, therefore, in the whole of our being, and obviously, therefore, first and foremost, in the mind itself. For as a man thinks, so he is. So you go on being renewed always, constantly. In the spirit of your mind. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.